Let's go ahead and bring in 11 Alive legal analyst Paige Pate to dig deeper into the legal aspect of this. Thanks for being with us this morning. Now, we saw that deliberations only went on for three hours yesterday when the jury got the case. Started at 9 a.m. this morning. Here we are at 1042. Let's talk about the timing and just how sure they were with all these guilty charges. Well, the timing of the verdict and how short the deliberations were really suggests to me that they didn't have a problem at all with the government's case here. I think ending the case very strong with the prosecutors reminding the jury about those horrific uh, text messages, social media posts, left this jury very upset with these defendants. So normally, even in a case where there's going to be a guilty verdict, if you have three defendants and multiple charges, the jury usually takes a good deal of time to go through the evidence, go through the legal elements, and reach a verdict, a unanimous verdict. Didn't take much time at all for this case. So that, to me, suggests the prosecution's case was very strong. And we're talking text messages they went through, social media posts, and in the comments section. So a lot of people think these things are closeted in some regards, but these were very public displays. And we had text messages of William Roddy Bryan saying that his daughter had just started dating an N-word in regards to the MLK Day Parade. Travis and Michael refer to it as the monkey parade. A lot of these details were new and were not mentioned in the state trial. And so as that was coming out and just hearing these things, like you said, it seems like the jury was pretty riled up. And let's talk about the jury. We had eight white people, three black people, and one Hispanic juror, and we had three white alternates. What message is this sending, especially for hate crimes, pretty hard to convict? Yeah, I think the message here is crystal clear. I think the federal government, by pursuing this case, and they got some criticism for doing that. I mean, these defendants had already been convicted of murder and other charges in state court. They were going to spend their life in prison regardless. But the federal government said, look, this is a priority. We want to send a message that not just the murder was wrong, but the reason they did it was wrong. And so I think given the makeup of this jury, the fact that it comes from a mostly conservative South Georgia uh, district here, rural people, um, some small town folks who got together and even with that background, even with that conservative bent, found that this was just too much to tolerate and they would not let the racism go unpunished. From the legal aspect, let's talk about how long it took to get here as we have the charges pulled up right now. We're talking interference with rights, attempted kidnapping, and using and carrying a firearm. We see Travis McMichael, the one who we know, pulled the trigger with that shotgun, ending Ahmaud Albury's 25-year-old life. Guilty on all three charges there. His father, Gregory McMichael, interference with rights as well, that attempted kidnapping and using a firearm. And also, we know that it was William Roddy Bryant. It was his truck that was used to, so to speak, his form of a weapon. The prosecution and the defense really went back and forth about the fibers from Ahmaud Albury's shirt being found on that truck. And that's where William Roddy Bryan comes in. His text messages and history of using racist language was also a heavy focus here as well. And as we look at the charges, you know, I think it's really telling. It took 10 weeks just to get an arrest. So now we have the death of Ahmaud Albury, February 23rd. That is tomorrow, two years to the day, 2022, taking nearly 10 weeks to get an arrest. And now we've had convictions on the state level and now the federal level. This is a really strong message, Paige Pate. Uh, it, it's a very strong message. And I think everyone needs to remember, not only did it take some time for any arrest to be made, but for the release of that video, we wouldn't be talking about this case. There would have been no state trial. There would have been no federal trial. This case would have been completely swept under the rug. But for reasons no one has quite figured out, the initial lawyer for Greg McMichael thought the video was a good thing, and they released it. And obviously, as a result of releasing that video, it came to the attention of leaders here in Georgia, across the country, across the world, really. And that reaction led to the two prosecutions and ultimately to the verdicts that we have today. So it's an amazing turn of events that went from the incident where Ahmaud Arbery was killed to what has finally happened today. 
And now we talked about, you know, the fact that pursuing this on the federal level, you mentioned that, hey, why would you do this when they're already facing life in prison? And then some of these charges also face the possibility of life in prison. I think that is a really important aspect too, especially for the family. We've heard, you know, Ahmad's father, Marcus, and we've heard Wanda Cooper Jones say, hey, it doesn't matter. We are in this fight for the long haul. And they've been really, really adamant about saying we want justice across the board 100 percent. Yes, I think the family certainly got what they wanted, and, and clearly uh, it's been a struggle. Um, Ahmad Arbery's mother has, uh, you know, almost single-handedly uh, pursued this aggressively to make sure that justice was ultimately achieved for her son. But it's not just important to the family. I mean, I completely understand why the current administration, the attorney general, said, "Look." Even though these folks are going to be spending life in prison, it's still important to bring these hate crime charges to get a conviction because it's not just about Ahmaud Arbery and his family. It's about this community. It's about the way we're going to deal with cases like this. And I think the community here in Brunswick benefits from this verdict almost as much as the Arbery family. And I think it's also telling not, not only there with the community, but this was national. We can all get those sure. visuals of May 2020 with people in the streets of Atlanta and just the amount of anger and frustration that was boiling over during the height there of the social justice movement. We have the uh, case dealing with civil rights in regards to George Floyd with the additional three officers happening in Minneapolis. What do we say about all of these cases happening together in the fact we know what 2020 symbolized. It really is a sea change. I mean, things are so much different now. I mean, I've been practicing in federal court for over 25 years, and it used to be the federal government would occasionally bring hate crime charges if they thought the defendants who ever committed the crime were not being prosecuted at the state level or not prosecuted properly at the state level. Not so anymore. Uh, and I think people now realize that if you commit a crime like this, not only is it going to be prosecuted, it's going to be prosecuted as much as it possibly can be to the fullest extent of the law, both state, federal, and, and obviously from the reaction of the jury, the very quick verdict, uh, people are ready for that change. And, and I think we've seen it in this case. We've obviously seen it in the George Floyd case, but to me, this case hits home more than George Floyd because of the jurisdiction that we're in. And, and I don't think um, we, can, we can emphasize that too much. I think it really is significant. When we had so many people show up for jury duty that questioned even the reason for a hate crimes charge in this case, to see them come back after listening to this evidence sends a very powerful message. And historically, hate crimes charges have been very, very hard to get convictions on. Why has that, you know, really been the case? And I think in this day and time, I can almost bet that your response is going to have to do with social media. We heard so many horrific details here, things that you don't think people even say in 2022. But all of that was really uncovered. The veil has been lifted for sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, if you're these defendants and you're listening to this trial, I mean, you're thinking these things that you said uh, are never going to be um, you know, displayed publicly in the light of day. Obviously, if you put stuff out on social media, it sticks around. And in a case like this, it shows exactly how these three people felt, what they thought, um, and why, in this case, they committed the, the crime that they did. Hate crimes charges are traditionally difficult because you have to show more than just hate. You have to show more than racial prejudice. You have to show that was the motivating factor for the crime. But here, I think the evidence of prejudice was so strong and the circumstances of this offense so clear that the jury didn't have a problem with it at all. Hopefully this is causing a lot of people to question their hearts and if they are carrying any hate in their heart and just how detrimental some of those decisions can be life altering for these families for sure. Stand by, stick with us. Let's take you back out now to our crews in Brunswick where, you know, that crowd is out there really at the federal courthouse and now this decision has been made. Let's get reaction from Brunswick. Looks like our crews are standing by getting ready to join us here coming up here in just a little bit. We have Don White and Hope Ford 
Hope for it was actually inside the courtroom. And to keep in mind, if you guys are wondering where's the video aspect, like we saw those reactions during the state trial, that is because in federal court, cameras are not allowed inside, but we did have our crew in there to get that firsthand account. Let's now take you back to Brunswick. Yeah, Aisha, I just ran, uh, ran out of there just a few minutes ago as that uh, verdict was being announced. Uh, and so you would have, as you would expect, there was quiet in the courtroom as those jurors uh, came back in. When they originally announced that the verdict was going to be uh, taking place, there was uh, a lot of the family in there. The mom and dad for Ahmaud Arbery were not in there yet, but uh, some other family members, they started crying right when they heard that they had that verdict. Um, and then there was some conversation about how quickly that verdict came down. It was about three hours and 46 minutes altogether with, with this uh, jury deliberating. So whenever they did come back in and uh, started delivering that verdict, uh, there was uh, Wanda Cooper-Jones, Ahmaud Arbery's mother, and Marcus Arbery, his father, who were sitting in the front row with some other family right behind the prosecution. And then, on, of course, on the other side, you had uh, Lee McMichael, who is Travis's mom, and Greg's wife was sitting a couple of rows behind them. Uh, everyone looked straight ahead as those jurors came back in, and they started delivering that verdict. Verdict. When that first ver guilty verdict went out for Travis McMichael, you did see uh, Travis kind of lower his head a little bit. Um, but there, that was really the only reaction as all of those guilty verdicts were read out for, for, for all three of them uh, at that point in time. And I believe right now, we have the family that's coming out. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, emotional reaction from them whenever they came out the first, whenever they, uh, the, the verdict was read at that point in time, you did have Marcus Arbery, who is Ahmaud's father. He did give a silent celebration. Uh, his mother kind of just looked straight ahead the whole time. Really a whole, not a whole lot of reaction uh, this time around as compared to the original trial where there was tears and even an outburst from Marcus Arbery at that point in time whenever he had to leave the courtroom in the original trial. So not a whole lot of re reaction from, the, uh, from, from either side this time around. But there were tears in that courtroom and it was interesting the tears that were coming were not from the families of anybody or the defendants or anything there was actually from the four person so the person uh, who delivered the verdict to the four person um, it, the only black male on the the jury and um, as they were reading the verdict and as they were uh, talking and asking all of the jurors if they did freely give that uh, that that verdict you did see him wipe away tears he struggled to talk at one point in time and he did cry several times again the only black male on the jury and then one of the assistants for the prosecution team for the government uh, she actually started crying as well the uh, she was a black female who is on uh, on there after the judge praised the prosecution team for being able to do their job and uh, saying how difficult it is to give that uh, to prove that that racial arc in these types of tri of crimes, um, so it's, I believe the family's going to walk up there and talk right now. I'm not sure if your guys are going to be able to hear what they're what they're saying uh, at this point in time, but um, so we're going to just kind of pause for just a second so that we can hear what they're going to say. It is because of their conviction to get full justice not partial justice for their son Ahmaud Aubrey. We get to celebrate this moment on behalf of everybody who has been with them the whole journey. Uh, my great co-counsel Lee Merritt who is in Texas in a, a historic campaign to become the first black attorney